Welcome back to Information Systems and Cybersecurity 375. We're going to continue our discussion of scalable vector graphics today. So last time we talked about some of the advantages of scalable vector graphics for the web. We said that compared to bitmap images, such as uh, portable network graphic and JPEG, that scalable vector graphics um, have this property that when we grow them or shrink them, they scale smoothly. So they look nice uh, whether we zoom in or zoom out. And this is really appropriate for the web, because on the web we don't know what size screen we're going to have, and the web browser may need to resize things to make things fit on the page. So we also talked about some things we could do with SVG. We talked about making lines and drawing rectangles and circles, ellipses. We even talked about uh, polygons and polylines. Uh, I said in the previous lecture that there are some other kinds of objects that we can use SVG to create, such as paths and text. And actually, we can embed raster images into the SVG file as a shape. So today, we're going to talk about those things. Let's start by talking about paths. Now, paths are actually pretty straightforward conceptually, but it turns out that the language that we use to describe them in SVG is a little bit complicated and uh, a little archaic. The language that we use for paths actually comes from another programming language, a language called PostScript that was used uh, as early as the 60s or 70s. It was created by Adobe as a language for programming printers. And essentially what it allows you to do is program a pen. And you can say to this pen, start here and draw lines here, draw circles here, uh, and then go back to where you started. And PostScript is a great and wonderful language. It's not used heavily anymore because PDF has replaced it. PDF is a new printing language. But um, a lot of the elements of PostScript have worked their way into SVG in the path element. So I think the best way to explain paths is to start with an example. So here I've created an SVG file. I've set the width and height of the SVG image to 50 by 50, like we did last time. And I've added a path element. Now, notice that I can uh, add some attributes to my path element like I did the other shapes. In particular, I've given this one a stroke width of 1. I've told it to uh, use green ink to draw the image. And I'm not going to have any fill. What's different about the path is that it takes this attribute named D. And D is short for data. And in the D attribute, I have this kind of cryptic string. It says M 20, comma, sorry, 10, comma 20. L 20 comma 20, L 20 comma 30, L 10 comma 30, Z. This is the path string, and uh, we're going to explain all of those different pieces in just a minute. First, let me show you what this looks like if I render it. So if I were to pull up this SVG file in an SVG editor like Inkscape, it would show me something like this. It's going to be a green square. And the reason for that is that in my D element, I have a series of commands. So a path is a little bit like polyline. You may remember when I draw a polyline, I give it a points attribute. And in that points attribute, I give it a space-separated list of coordinates. And the coordinates are expressed as pairs of numbers uh, with a comma in between. Here, instead of a series of points, what I'm giving the path element is a series of commands, drawing commands. So the first command in my D attribute is M10, sorry, M10, 20. I don't know why I keep saying 20. M10, 20. And M stands for move. So we're going to move the pen that we're drawing with to coordinates 10, 20. So it'll be 10 over from the right and 20 down from the top of the screen. The next command is L20, 20. The L command draws a line. So we're going to draw a line from the current position of the pen to position 20, 20. That's drawing the top side of the square. So we're drawing the top side of the square from 10, 20 to 20, 20. The next command is L2030. L2030 means draw a line to position 2030. So I'm going to start where I left off at position 2020 and draw a line down to 2030. This is the right side of the square. Um, and then I'll draw a line to 1030. That's the bottom of the square. And finally, I have this Z command. The Z command is how we close a path. And that basically says draw a line back to where you started. So that'll put in the last side of the square, the left side. So I mentioned before the paths are a lot like polygon or polyline. But instead of describing them using points, we're going to describe them using commands. And many of those commands will take arguments. Those arguments are typically a number or a point. However, um, 
SVG paths are a little bit more sophisticated than polylines. They allow things uh, like drawing objects with holes. So I can actually draw curves with a, with a path instead of a straight line. Uh, I can draw in shapes like a heart or a pretzel or a star or a donut with a hole in the middle. There's lots of things I can draw with a path that I can't draw with just polygon and polyline. So there are a lot of different commands that you can include in your path attributes. Uh, we're going to talk about just five or six different kinds of commands. So in this case, we're going to talk about the move to command, or m command, which we've already mentioned briefly. We're going to talk about the line to command that lets us draw lines, the curve to commands, the arc to commands, and the close path command. All of these commands, except for close path, take at least one argument. So you can think of path drawing as programming a pen. We're going to draw on the screen with a pen, and we're going to tell the pen where to go. So uh, before we go further, I want to give you a little disclaimer. And that is that most of what I'm about to show you is not something you would ever do in real life. If you're creating a real web page, you probably would not draw an SVG path by hand. You wouldn't just say, hmm, I think the point goes at 1050. And then I'm going to draw a line to 2070, uh, guessing where the points go. That's not at all what you would do. What you would really do is pull up a program like Inkscape or Sodipodi or Carbon. All of these are SVG editors. And there's some nice online sites, too, that let you draw SVGs. And you get this nice graphical environment that lets you draw rectangles and circles and paths and you draw your scene using that tool. And when you save the file, you would save it as SVG. And then you would import that into your web page. You'd copy and paste it, or you'd um, use a link tag to pull it in, or an image source tag, or an object tag. So um, there's lots of different ways that we could do this. Why am I going to show you how to do this by hand if you're never, ever going to do that? Well, I think it's actually really valuable to look at how this works. If you understand the path mechanism, if you understand how to do it by hand, then you will understand exactly what it's doing, and you'll be able to write JavaScript code to manipulate it so that we can do things like animations, uh, so that we can transform our graphics so that they look nice in the page with CSS. So this is really good stuff. Um, actually, every year in my software engineering class, I tell the students that they have to pair up and do a semester project. And that semester project always involves contributing to an open source project. And they can pick which open source project they contribute to, but it has to be an open source project that I can uh, download and grade. And last year, two of my students did something really neat. They worked on a project called ABCJS, which is a web library that allows you to draw sheet music on a website. So if I have a song and I want to share the sheet music for my song, I think actually the main use of this is like banjo melodies. But um, I can put those up on the web by pulling in this JavaScript library and writing a quick function, um, that, uh, a data file actually, that has the notes for my song and it displays it on the web and allows people to edit it and do all sorts of cool things, print it. But of course, there aren't very many shapes for the musical notes. There's uh, hundreds and thousands of different symbols you need uh, to represent real music, real sheet music, and those are not basic shapes in SVG. So what you do is you draw these different shapes with paths. And so my students spend a lot of time learning how paths worked uh, and actually manipulating them on a web page. So this is a useful skill, and there are real projects that uh, involve knowing this kind of thing. So let's look at those commands that we can use really quickly. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is the move to command. The move to command is the M command. And as I said before, what it does is it moves the pen to a new location of the image without drawing a line on the screen. It just jumps from one place to another. So I can move the pen to 1020 and draw some lines, and then move it somewhere else and draw some other lines. So I can have one path that has maybe two shapes in it. It takes two arguments, an x and y coordinate, because we have to know where the pen should go. So there's actually two versions of the M command. If you use capital M, uh, then you, the coordinates are absolute coordinates. So if I say capital M, 10, 5, it's going to put me at exactly at, at um, the point 10, 5 in my image. 10 over from the left and 5 down from the top of the image. On the other hand, if I use lowercase m, little m, then uh, it uses relative coordinates. And so what that means is that it looks at where the pen is currently, and it moves that many squares in the x and y directions. So if I'm at position 1020 and I move 105 with little m, uh, it's going to move me to 2015. 
The Z command we also looked at already. That's the closed path command. And all it does is draw a line, a straight line, back to the initial pen position, which closes the path. Basically, it takes an object that's not finished, and it finishes it by connecting it to the beginning. Another simple command is the line to command, or L command. Like the move to command, it takes an X and a Y argument, and those specify the position of the new point. So if I move to 1020 and I draw a line to 1030, it's going to draw a line down 10 pixels. So 1020 to 1030. Um, so M1020, L1030 will draw a vertical line. If I use capital L, it uses absolute positions, just like capital M. If I use little l, it'll use relative positions, just like little m. Uh, another way to draw lines is to use the H command or the V command. H draws a horizontal line and V draws a vertical line. H and V only take one argument because if I'm drawing a horizontal line, I, the Y coordinate stays the same, and so I just need to know the new X coordinate. If I'm drawing a vertical line, the X coordinate stays the same, so I just need to know the new Y coordinate. I think I said that backwards. I know the x coordinate, and because uh, the x coordinate stays the same, I just need a new y coordinate. Again, capital H is absolute coordinates, little h is relative. Capital V absolute coordinates, little v relative. So in addition to straight lines, I can draw curves with a path. That's one of the advantages of paths. If I use a polyline, I get straight lines. And I can make um, different kinds of shapes, but they have straight sides. If I want something that's curved, like maybe a heart shape, I need to use a path. So there are several different kinds of curves that SVG supports. And we're going to talk really about three different kinds. So the first kind is called the cubic Bezier curve. A cubic Bezier curve is specified using two control points and a destination. And we'll learn more about what those control points are in a minute. A quadratic Bezier curve only has one control point, but it also has a destination attribute. And finally, we can also use elliptical arcs. Um, these are a little bit different. The idea is that instead of specifying a curve from one point to another, we specify an ellipse. And um, it has a radius in the x direction and a radius in the y direction. And uh, we tell it how much of an angle to sweep out around the ellipse. And so that makes kind of a curve by following the ellipse, a different shape of curve. So if I use the C command, uh, SVG will generate a Bezier curve using two control points. So I've drawn a, sort of a picture of what this looks like down below uh, using this path command. So uh, here I don't have any fill. I am using a green stroke. I've set my stroke width to 1. Um, I've zoomed way in, though, so that's why it looks so blocky. Um, and then my path, my D attribute, my data, is the sequence of commands M1010, C155, 25, 25, 10. So what's happening here is that the first command moves the pen to position 1010. The second command creates a curve from that initial position, from 1010, to position 2510. So I'm going from 1010 to 2510. And I'm specifying two control points along the way, 15.5 uh, and 25. And those control points sort of stretch the line, bending it into a curve. So what I've drawn below here is that curve. And you can see uh, in gray where those two control points are. If I were to take the left control point and move it up a little bit, the green curve would bend upward too. In fact, it might become kind of like camel shaped. It would have like two humps. Um, if I were to move that control point further to the uh, left, then the curve would actually get pulled to the left. So it would be taller on the left and have kind of a tail to the right. So adjusting the positions of the control points changes the shape of the curve. And with uh, this kind of Bezier curve, I have um, two control points. Notice that in this case, actually, my two control points are symmetric. If I were to cut the curve in half, um, I've put both control points equal distances from that axis in between. And they're uh, in the same line horizontally also. Uh, this is a pretty common usage of the curve. And, uh, usually I want my two control points to be symmetric so I get a nice even curve. In fact, that's so common that SVG provides an S command that does exactly that. The S command is just like the C command, except that you only specify one of the control points. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to put in 15.5. Um, SVG will put in the matching one for you automatically, the symmetric one. So it'll put in a control point at 25. 
Another kind of Bezier curve is a quadratic curve. The quadratic curve is a lot like the, uh, the other curves we've talked about, except that instead of two control points, it only uses one. And so if you look at the image at the bottom, you can see I've got a black point. And as I move it around, the shape of the curve will change. So right now, that uh, control point is slightly offset to the left. And so the curve has kind of a hill to the left and a tail to the right. So uh, we can get quadratic Bezier curves using the Q or the T commands. The difference is that the T command gives you what's called a smooth quadratic curve. So here's an example. If you want to draw the curve that I've shown below, you would have a path object, and you would set the D attribute to M1010. Again, I'm positioning the pen initially at position 1010. And then Q for quadratic, 15, 5, 25, 10. So um, the 25, 10 is the destination point. I'm drawing a curve from the current position, which happens to be 1010, to 25, 10. And I'm specifying that the position of the control point is 15, 5. Notice that I can have a space separated list of arguments to these path commands. Another way to get a curve is to draw an elliptical arc. I already talked a little bit about how that works. We specify the x radius and the y radius of the ellipse, and then a rotation angle to sweep out. Uh, it, you also have to give it two Boolean flags. These have to be either 0 or 1, and they configure some of the display properties of the arc. I'm not really going to talk about those. And of course, we have to give it the end point. So here's an example. Um, again, I move the pen to 1010. And then the command is a 5, 10, 0, 0, 0, 25 comma 10. So 5 comma 10 um, are my radii. I'm going to have a radius of width 5 for my ellipse and width 10 in the y axis. So you can see that this curve that I've drawn is taller than it is wide. That's because the y axis is 10 units tall and the x axis is only 5 units wide. The next number is the angle to sweep out. I've set it to 0, the default, so we get a half of an ellipse. And then 0, 0 are the Boolean flags. I've turned them both off because I don't need them. And finally, the destination point is 2510. So we're drawing an ellipse there um, along this elliptic curve. I can also have text in my SVG file. Um, I might want to use this for like a logo or for some labels. Maybe I want to have a chart and I want to draw some rectangles for my bars and then have uh, labels on the axes and um, underneath each bar. So I can add text to my drawing with the text element. The text element takes really just three attributes plus the standard ones like fill and stroke. It takes uh, an x and a y coordinate, and those are the coordinates of the first letter. I believe, although I, don't, I didn't look this up before the lecture, I believe they're the top left corner of the first letter. Um, and then I can specify an angle of rotation using the rotate attribute. So I can either have text that's straight, that's the default, or if I specify a rotate attribute, I can rotate my text 45 degrees or even 95 degrees and have it run straight up and down. I could turn it all the way upside down by rotating 180 degrees. That's kind of cool. Uh, if I want to add style to my text, maybe put it in bold or italics, or give it a special font like Verdana, um, I could use the T-span tag. So here's an example. Uh, I have my SVG image, and inside it I have a text tag. I position the text at the coordinates 10, 10, x is 10, and y is 10. And inside my text element, I have the text, this is a very important message. Notice that I start my text with a text tag and end it with a slash text tag. I've actually left out the word A, apparently. I just noticed that. I'm sorry about that. And inside my text element, I have a T-span element that sets the font weight to bold. So the word very, because it's between the T-span and the slash T-span tags, will be bolded. And sure enough, if you were to plot this in Inkscape or another SVG viewer, you would see this is a very important message. I'm sorry that the A is missing. I don't know how I didn't catch that. One of the neat features of SVG is that we can actually group several objects together to make a new shape. We can actually define new shapes. And we can transform them and uh, stroke them and fill them in the same way that we can manipulate basic shapes. So we do that with the G tag. G stands for group. And it's useful to give the group an ID. So in this case, I've created a new group. I've given it the ID bicycle. And what I'm grouping together are four basic elements. I have two circles and two lines. The, circle, the first circle is centered at 2050 and has radius 10. The second circle is centered at 6050 and has radius 10. Those are going to be the wheels of my bicycle. I've also drawn two lines. I've drawn a black line that goes up from the front wheel at kind of an angle to be the handlebars. And then I've drawn a blue line connecting the two wheels. Not a very pretty bicycle. I am not an artist. 
Once we've created a group, we can actually um, create clones of that group. We can stamp out a bunch of bicycles using the use tag. So here we're going to say use. And notice that the syntax here is kind of weird. It says excellent colon href. You may remember that in HTML, when we have a link, we use href equals to specify the source of a file. In this case, we have to put excellent colon in front because uh, SVG works that way. So um, we have this excellent colon href attribute. We're going to set it equal to hash bicycle. And we're going to set the x and y coordinates to 20 and 80. I'm also going to apply a transformation. I'm going to rotate the bicycle 45 degrees clockwise. I think actually what I really did was negative 45 so that it went counterclockwise, but we'll see when we look at it in a minute. But so that would look like this. Yep, I rotated it counterclockwise. So the bicycle um, on the top left is uh, the original bicycle. It's the original group. And uh, you can see it's got two black circles, a blue line, and then kind of this black uh, slanted line for the handlebars. And it's positioned just straight. Then um, the use tag pulled in a copy of the bicycle and rotated it 45 degrees. And so that's to the right. Another neat thing that you can do with groups is that you can um, use the use tag to clone it, but change some of the properties. So here's an example of doing that. Again, I'm using the bicycle. Notice I have xlink colon href again. And I've set that to hash bicycle. And notice that the notation is very similar to CSS. I set the x and y coordinates to 2080. I'm transforming it, this time by rotating it negative 45 degrees, which is the, what I really did the first time. But this time, I'm also going to set the stroke color to silver and the stroke width to 5. And notice how that affected this. The bicycle on the right now has much thicker lines. Instead of being one pixel wide, they're five pixels wide. And I've put a silver stroke around the wheels of the bicycle. Uh, the reason that those elements are affected and not the others is that I hadn't specified a stroke for them yet. So they will inherit the stroke and stroke width of the use element. So if you want to make a reusable group without drawing it into your image, maybe you're not sure where you want to put it yet, but you want to design it and then pull it in later, maybe transforming it first, um, you can do that. But you have to uh, add an additional tag. And the way that that works is we put the keyword defs, the tag defs at the top and slash defs at the bottom, and put our group inside it. So here I've taken the same group I used before, the bicycle, and I've put it between the defs and a slash defs tag. And now I can use it just like I did before with a use tag. But this time, it will only draw the second bicycle. It won't draw the first one, because it's a definition of a bicycle. It's not an actual bicycle I'm drawing. Um, a minute ago, I told you one of the things I can do to an object or a group is to transform it. So there's a transform attribute that I can specify in the use tag, but also in other shapes, uh, rectangles, circles, lines. And uh, there's different transformations that I can apply. This is very similar to the animations that we did with CSS, the transformations for CSS. So in particular, there's a method for rotating by a fixed angle. There's a method for translating by a certain amount horizontally and a certain amount vertically. I can scale objects in the x and y dimensions, or I can skew them in the x or the y dimensions. Skewing means I sort of squish the object. So if I skew it in the x dimension, I'm sort of squishing it along the x-axis. If I skew it horizontally or vertically, uh, if I do a skew y, I'm squishing along the y-axis. <coughs> I can actually use the defs tag to do some other cool things. Not only can I define groups, but I can define gradients and patterns. Um, so I can make what we call abstract styles that can be applied to other elements as fill. So here's an example of how I would create a gradient. I have my defs and my slash defs tag. And in between, I have a linear gradient tag. Notice I've given it an idea of water. I'm going to use some water-like colors. To define a gradient, uh, a gradient, of course, is a way to smoothly change colors from a starting color to an ending color. So instead of filling everything with the same color, I'm going to have this transition. So in order to find a gradient, I have to define certain stops that tell SVG how to render that particular gradient. Um, where in the image should it switch from one color to another? So here I have three offsets, three stops. And the first one will happen on the left side at 0%. And uh, at 0%, at the start of my, my image, start of my shape, the color will be blue. As I move to the right, it's going to change from blue to gray. And when I get to 50%, it should be gray. 
And my last offset, or my last stop, is at 100%, which is all the way on the right. And it, when I get all the way to the right, the, the color should be white. Uh, white will be on the right, yes. OK, so beneath my defs tags, I have an example of how to use this. I have a rectangle. It's at position 10, 10, the top left corner. It's a 30 by 30 square. And I filled it with the water gradient. Notice I can use the URL method uh, to pull in the water gradient. I believe actually that's optional. I think SVG can parse just hash water without the URL method. But it's considered a good style to use URL. So that would look like this. Here's my rectangle, my square. And notice on the left I have blue. As I move toward the middle, it becomes gray. And then as I move from the middle to the right, it becomes white. I guess it doesn't look very much like water, but it's close enough. There are a lot of other things I can do with gradients. Um, this gradient goes from left to right, but you can actually rotate the gradient so that the color change happens from a corner and moves diagonally. You can scale it in different ways and apply different effects. Uh, there's a lot more here that I don't have time to share with you. In addition to linear gradients, SVG provides radial gradients. Radial gradients, instead of going in a straight line from one side to the other, actually are circular. So one color, you have one color in the middle, and as you expand out in a circle, the colors change. So it's very similar to a linear gradient. Here's an example of a radial gradient that I've given the ID fire. At the center of the circle, it's going to be red. As we grow out toward the outside of the circle, it's going to turn first orange and then yellow. And then by the time we get to the outside of the circle, it's going to turn red again. Notice that I don't have to have even offsets. So my first set of offsets goes from 0% to 50% in one jump. And then I have more rapid changes. By the time I get to 75%, I'm yellow. And then at 100%, I'm red. So I went 50% in one jump and then 25% in two successive jumps. Again, there's a lot more to gradients that you can read about online. W3Schools is a great resource for this. In addition to filling with a solid color or a gradient, we can fill with a pattern. Um, again, we have to use defs for this. So here's an example of an SVG image. It's a 500 by 500 image. I've got a set of definitions. And in those definitions, I have a pattern. Notice that my pattern tag takes a lot of attributes. I've given it the ID checkers, because it's going to be a, kind of a checkerboard pattern. I have to specify a width and a height. And I've decided to make it a 20 by 20 pattern. The reason I have to do that is that the pattern is going to repeat over and over and over to fill the image. Maybe I'm filling a circle or a rectangle. It's going to have to repeat over and over to fill that shape. I can also specify an offset so that the, um, the pattern image doesn't necessarily line up with the coordinates of the filling image. I can, I can shift it a little bit so that I get a nicer repetition. In this case, I've decided not to do that, so I've set the x and y coordinates to 0. Um, x and y specify the coordinates of the offset. And finally, I have a pattern units attribute that's actually really important. Pattern units tells SVG um, whether to use the coordinates of the pattern or the coordinates of the parent um, in the definition. So here I've decided I want my coordinates in the shapes that make up the pattern to be relative to each other, not relative to the parent shape that I'm filling. So I've set pattern units to the string user space on use. That's kind of a mouthful. OK, I've defined my, the start and end of my pattern. And then I have to define the shapes that make up the pattern inside. So I have, in this case, four rectangles. Two of them are black and two of them are white. Um, I've got black rectangles in the corners and red rectangles in the opposite corners to make kind of a checkerboard pattern. They're actually 10 by 10 squares. And then down below my uh, definitions, I've given you an example of a circle that I am stroking black but filling with a checkerboard pattern. It's centered at 250, 250, and it's radius 200. So it should almost, but not quite, fill my 500 by 500 image. So if I pull this up in Inkscape, this is Inkscape. This is what my circle would look like. <coughs> Instead of being filled red or blue or green, it's filled with this checkerboard pattern, which consists of red and black squares. And notice that SVG does the clipping for you so that we don't get a, a rectangle filled with my pattern. We actually get just a circle, and the rest of the pattern is hidden. 
Another thing that you can do in SVG, you can use text and paths, but you can also add raster images as shapes. We do that with the image tag. This is pretty straightforward. You give it an X and a Y coordinate. You're actually required to specify a width and a height if you do this. Uh, SVG needs to know the actual width and height in pixels of the image so that it can position it properly within the SVG document. Uh, again, to specify the source file of the raster, we don't use the SRC tag like we do in HTML. We actually use xlink colon href, just like we did uh, before when we were using gradients and patterns. Images are like other objects in SVG. They can be grouped and reused. They can be transformed, repositioned, or we can give them a border by stroking them. Suppose that you want to make something in the SVG file clickable. We can actually use an A tag to do that. Um, but it's not an HTML A tag, it's an SVG A tag. SVG has its own A tag that works a little bit differently. For the most part, it's the same. You say A, and then you specify your link, and then you put the text or the image that you want to be clickable, and then you have slash A at the end. The big difference is that with uh, HTML, the A tag took one attribute named href. Here, instead of href, we have to use xlink colon href. Uh, that's because SVG uses something called the xlink namespace. So if we don't use the xlink namespace, it doesn't know it's an SVG link, and it won't make it clickable. It just won't work. There's a lot more you can do with SVG. Um, SVG SVG provides tags for doing blurring, adding drop shadows underneath objects, um, adding specular reflections. Um, a specular reflection is kind of a cool thing. On a really sunny, bright day, if you look at something shiny, like maybe the hood of a car, you suddenly see those big white glowing spots. Those are specular reflections. And SVG has support uh, for effects that will add a specular reflection. Um, instead of just drawing text in a straight line, you can actually draw text along a path. So you could draw it in a circle or on a curve um, or even like a zigzag. And that's kind of neat. You can do animations. Um, and there's all sorts of tags for doing masking and clipping, which we're not going to talk about um, in this course. So in summary, in SVG, we can have not just basic shapes, but also text and images and paths. You can group some of those together and transform them or reuse them. And you can fill elements not just with a solid color, but also with a gradient or with a pattern. I hope that you'll play around with this and see what you can do. I'm look forward, looking forward to seeing you later on the next lab. Have a great week.